sorry for being late. Anyway, um, hello, my name, yes, let me write my email in case you need to contact me. It's double C. If you spell it with one C, it, it, it doesn't get through. Mm, yes. So I, I'm here this week, next week, and basically most of, of the following weeks. I, I'm stuck here. Basically, um, so uh, it's my name. My, um, I, I work in gravitational wave in a broad sense both on the phenomenological aspect um, and some uh, uh, theoretical understanding of the dynamics of the source. Because, as uh, you will know by Friday, uh, it's crucial to understand the dynamics of the source of gravitational wave to detect them. Okay, so what I will do for most part of the lecture today, I will basically be a trailer. I will give you a summary, so like in the movie, I, I, I often watch the trailer, not to decide if I want to actually watch the movie or not. So I will give you a 40 minute summary of all what I will do in the next four hours and a half. And uh, basically, now let me, a very, very basic summary. So I will give some uh, uh, observational overview first, very quickly. And then I will, um, I will, I mean, this is the summary of the whole course, not of today, the whole course. Basically, the observational overview will probably take most of mm, today. Uh, and then I will try to um, describe uh, binary system dynamics. Why? Because gravitational waves that we've seen so far, they all belong, they are all sourced by binary systems, so this is the phenomenological interesting case. And then uh, mm, I will try to, 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 give, to give you a hint of how, mm, what is the relationship between these multiple expansions that is ubiquitous in the general relativity treatment of uh, sources with uh, small velocities. And uh, how it, it explains uh, both conservative and dissipative dynamics conservative and dissipative dynamics into body, into body GR. I mean, all what I'm going to say is about GR, and I will never step out of GR. And then finally, I will do, you see, I start with some observational overview, then I increase, um, I, I, I increase the level of theory, I'm going to describe, uh, going to give you a hint of what is our, uh, uh, more than a hint, actually, of our analytical description of the two-body dynamics, and then I will go back to phenomenology and tell you how the result I will, I will sketch today are actually derived from what I, I will do in the middle. So we start from observation, we start from the sky, then we go down to the books and then derivations, and then we make the bridge between how what we'll be computing in the next three weeks is useful to go back and uh, infer the parameter of what we see in the sky. Okay, but before I start, I'd like to make a, um, okay, so I, I said a little bit about myself, so I also work uh, in the LIGO scientific collaboration, specifically on issues related to waveform uh, modeling uh, of the signal seen by LIGO and Virgo, you know the fourth science run of LIGO is ongoing now. Uh, it started uh, two months ago, exactly two months ago in May, and it will last for 18 more months. And um, Virgo, unfortunately, couldn't make it to join. You know, experimental phys physics is not like theoretical. I mean, you don't, it's not that you sit and the computation, well, even in theoretical physics, the computation might turn out right or wrong, and then you have to insist in the experiment. Somehow it can, can, be, it can be similar, but worse, 
in the sense that they, um, uh, they have some ugly source of noise they cannot track down, so Virgo is not taking data now. Then there is a Japanese detector wi which is also in commissioning phase, and commissioning means that they are still tuning it to reach good sensitivity. And then um, hopefully in a few years time, but not before your PhD surely, uh, the Indian um, interferometer detector will also join the network. So this is the, and then in next uh, decade we'll have a space interferometer uh, called LISA and then we'll have the next generation of the present Earth interferometer to detect gravitational waves. So in principle you don't even know what is a gravitational wave detector but th this will be part probably, you know, when I do phenomenology, when I bridge the gap between theoretical computations and observation, I will tell you, yes. Oh, for, okay, if there is an, um, so, you know, there is a website you, you, where you can see events live. So, in minutes after the event is recorded, uh, you go to this website and you see the event. It's called Grace, I mean, I don't remember on the top, but if you just Google GraceDB, LIGO, alert event, uh, live event, you, you will see it. Um, all, all of this has to be confirmed. These are just um, live alert because if there is something that you, you would expect to have an electromagnetic counterpart, you need the optical observatory to point right away. So these alerts are given minutes afterwards. But of course, they need refinement. They might be retracted if there was a glitch or an artifact in the detector. So the official um, results of LIGO will come out. So this uh, 04 will take 20 months. The first 10 months will be published, basically. The result of the 10 months will be published at the end of the 20 months. Basically, there will be one, hour, uh, one year and a half delay between the end of the chunk and the release of um, the results. But, you know, the live big event, loud event, you can see them online. And if there is a, a special event, like something that triggers an electromagnetic counterpart, it will, uh, surely will be published before then this deadline. But yes, it, it's not, I mean, it will take some time. Okay. I said a little bit about myself, so I want to know very quickly, I want to make a poll about you. So, for instance, where you come from. So is there anybody from Europe here? Say. Four people from Europe, oh, five, six. Okay, you, you made all the way to come here. I feel flattered to, to hear my, uh, probably not for me, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, anybody from North America? Oh, a uh, lot of people from North America, five. Okay, I mean, I mean what is the aff your affiliation, not your passport um, uh, nationality. I'm asking about your affiliation, the university you are studying. And then North America include Mexico, right? Then, then you're also including in North America, including Mexico. Good. Then uh, south of Mexico, Mexico excluded up to Panama, say Central America and Caribe. Okay, good. Central America and Caribe. A few. And then Colombia, Venezuela. Let's come in closer to us. Colombia, Venezuela, nobody? Colombia, come on. There are a lot of people doing amplitudes in Colombia. Nobody come here. I, I will tell my colleagues there, I will scold them. And then uh, Peru, Ecuador, say, Peru, Ecuador. Okay, one, at least. I, I'm arriving there, wait, wait, wait. I'm not there yet. Yes, Chile, uh, Chile is next, yes. Chile, you are from Chile? Okay. okay, Chile is always sense representative. Uruguay, which is near door. I mean, you could come by boat, no, from Uruguay. <laughs> ah, there is a, oh, okay, good, Juan. Good, there is at least one guy from Colombia. Uh, and then, uh, okay, Uruguay, I said, uh, was somebody from Uruguay, yes. One, only one? Okay. Argentina, I mean, where you are next door. Ah, you're all busy in still celebrating the World Cup, eh? You don't want to study. <laughs> okay. And then Brazil, outside São Paulo. Brazil, outside São Paulo. Ah, okay. Yeah. And then São Paulo, I should know people from São Paulo, probably, yes. Okay. Very good. There's, uh, any, any country I missed, like, uh, I, I, I guess I didn't mention Africa, Asia, and Oceania, but I guess there's nobody from these continents. Okay, no. So everybody belongs to one of these macro regions that I mentioned. Good. Ah, and then, ah, another poll I want to make. So I guess you are, most of you are master, PhD, and then I, I see some elder face who might be a researcher. But I want to know the, the topic. You work more on 
amplitudes or on gravity? So raise your hand, those of you who work more on particle and amplitudes. Okay, those of you who work more on gravity. Ah, okay, not, uh, not, not a negligible fraction. So I, am I right, raise your hand, those of you who have been exposed to a GR course, who have seen GR course, all of you? Ah, not, somebody didn't raise it. So there is somebody who has not been exposed to GR course, right? There is somebody. General relativity, sorry. GR, because I'm, I, I, it's like a close friend. You don't call it general relativity. <laughs> close friend, for close friend, you use nicknames, no? So GR, basically, don't be shy. Is anybody who has not been exposed to a general relativity course? Who has not? I know. One should, okay, one. Okay. I guess you will soon catch up starting from in 10 minutes, basically. Okay, L so the previous lecture introduced many topics I will be used, but not today, because w we start today from a very broad uh, phenomenological overview. So first of all, we need to talk about distances, you know, where the sources are. So when you talk about distances, the typical unit of measure is a kilometer, but you will see the kilometer, we do very little with, with kilometer. So we only use kilometer in, in the solar system. So we know the distance to the sun is 150 million kilometers. And this is the Earth, and this is the sun. So this is the, la the last time you will see kilometers, basically. We'll never use kilometers. Why? Because what is uh, really the good, the good unit uh, for astrophysical sources, uh, even more for cosmology, is the parsec. How is defined the parsec? The parsec is the object that you will see if an object is at one parsec distance, like a star, uh, then you will see, by definition, a one, pa a one second parallax when the Earth moves from summer to winter, from one side to the other of the sun, then by definition, the object at one parsec will have a one second parallax. So let's, traduce, let's translate this. Uh, so we have um, uh, I mean elementary trigonometry, we have that one parsec must be equal to 1.8, 10 to the 8 kilometers di di divided by one second. One second in radians, it's one sixtieth. One second is one sixtieth of a minute, which is one sixtieth of a degree, which is pi divided by 180 in radians, okay? So if we do a little bit of math, let's see if I can do it right on the spot. So here I get, um, th these all go to the denominator. I get 1.5 divided by pi. And then I have 6, uh, 6, 6 times 2, it's a 7. But then I have, uh, let's take into account the, so I have 10 to the 8 kilometer. And here I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Mm? Because this is 36, this is a 2, 10 to the 2. So um, this will become a 70, and then I have four, or it's a seven, 10 to the five, seven by 1.5 divided by pi, I say it is three. So this is, should be 10 to the 33 kilometers. This is the parsec. The parsec is actually still very, very small for what we are typically looking at. So typically we have con considered objects which are outside our galaxy. So if we consider that our galaxy Okay, our galaxy, it, it has two arms, two spiral arms that are, uh, are uh, rolled around each other uh, a couple of times. So the size of our galaxy, uh, the luminous matter is 10, 20 megaparsec, kiloparsec. If you include dark matter, we get to 50 kiloparsec, okay? So for the moment, you, you, from now on, you can forget about uh, kilometers when you think about where sources are located. We go to the uh, size of the galaxy, which is of the order of kiloparsec. And then if you think about uh, what is the neighbor galaxy to us, it, it has also two arms. It's Andromeda, which is at 0.7 megaparsec. Okay, so this, this is the, the typical distance we are looking at. Our galaxy, 50 kiloparsec of size. We, we are here, we are basically eight kiloparsec from the center. 
this is our distance from the center of the galaxy. So it would be very uh, unpractical to use kilometers for this kind of object. And Andromeda, uh, of course, there are some small galaxies in between, but we, we don't, I mean, Andromeda is really the next um, neighbor galaxy which is as massive as us, more or less, which is the masses of us and the Andromeda galaxy, we are talking about 10 to the 12 solar masses. Then there are some dwarf galaxies here around, which are masses which are one, two order, three order of magnitude less. Let's say that the nearest galaxy which makes sense to consider as a mass contribution is Andromeda, which is here. Of course, our nearest galaxy is closer than the average distance between galaxies. So in the local group, so in this part of the universe where we are, we know that the distance within galaxy and galaxy is of the order of six megaparsec, okay? So this is what we are talking about when we talk about the density of galaxies in the universe. And I will leave it as an exercise. You can check, given the typical mass of a big galaxy, I mean, forgetting dwarf galaxy, given the, big, the mass of, uh, of a galaxy, you divide by six megaparsec cube, this will give a density, no? It's mass divided by volume. And then what is the typical density you might expect to compare it with? After all, we, we think now that our universe became very homogeneous, then there were regions of roughly one megaparsec that collapse and form galaxies. And so all the matter that was around is now concentrated in galaxy and which left void in between. Because of course we have a galaxy and they were, we have much more this, much more uh, share of the space which is void rather than full of galaxies. And so you might expect that this might be compared to the typical density of the universe. And the typical density of the universe, how, it is, how do we measure it? I mean, yes, we can go and count the galaxies and weight them, but there is a dynamical way to measure it, which is the Hubble constant. So the first of the freeman robertson walker um, equation, so we take a free, uh, universe, I, and this is not a course about cosmology, just giving you order of magnitude. Um, if you take the um, um, friedman robertson walker equation for a background uh, flat, for a, with a, 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 a universe without perturbation, you have that the uh, H, which is the um, uh, rate of expansion of the universe, which is the scale factor derivative divided by itself, so this is square, and this is square, has to be related with rho. I mean, dimensionally, you understand that this has to be the case. Even if you didn't study re general relativity or if you study general relativity but you didn't do cosmological application, let's understand this at least qualitatively. I mean, this is a density, mass divided by volume. Then I multiply by G. You remember, G Newton from now on will always be uh, for us a converter between mass to length, yes? I mean, if you're familiar with Farsi's solution, that should be natural, no? The perturbation of um, the metric is GM over R. So the perturbation is GM over R. So it's clear the perturbation of the metric is dimensionless. So G is just a converter from mass to length. For all what we need, our, um, com G Newton will be basically uh, 1.5 kilometer divided by one solar mass. This is the value of G Newton I will be using uh, repeatedly. No? You convert one solar mass to 1.5 kilometer. Basically, it's the time it takes for light to cross uh, a black hole of one solar mass, roughly speaking. Or if you like, it tells you what is the Schwarzschild radius, modulo a factor of two, of an object of a solar mass, okay? So we have a G Newton, which is uh, this converter from mass to space, from mass to length. And if you plug in here, you immediately get a one over a length square. This is one over length square. Of course, we'll be using speed of light equal to one extensively. And, se and so you can check that this typical density of galaxy that we see in the local universe is not too far from the Hubble scale. I, I won't do the, the details. I I'll leave this uh, an exercise. So the Hubble scale, as we know it today, it has this unit. It has this value in this unit. So it's seven kilometer per second per, megapar per uh, megaparsec, 
okay? So here I told you what is a parsec, a megaparsec is clearly one million of parsec, as the name says. Um, so why, I mean, this is um, the inverse of a time, or of a, an inverse of a length, sorry. The Hubble scale square is this value. So the Hubble scale is 70 kilometer per second divided per, per megaparsec. So why these funny units? No? This should be just a frequency no? as a unit, the inverse of a time. Why this funny unit? Well, it, has to, um, it relates a lot to how it is measured. How it is measured, the Hubble scale, is measured by the recession velocity of distant galaxies, not two distant galaxies. No? So you see a galaxy, you see how, what is the velocity of recession, and then you associate a distance. So basically, uh, if it has, uh, basically, uh, you associate the velocity of recession of the galaxy as uh, a zero times the distance, okay, roughly. So you get, uh, if you see such and such velocity, then basically you, you multiply both by the appropriate number of megaparsec to measure that um, if, you, if you see the velocity V, for your galaxy, you divide um, by the appropriate distance to get H0. Or if you like, you divide the velocity by H0. So when you put the zero denominator, velocity and velocity simplifies, and then you get the distance directly in megaparsec. Mm. That's the reason why this funny unit, kilometer per second per megaparsec. Well, it, is, it sh should actually be just the inverse of the time. But this is the inverse of the time. It's just in a suitable way that you can immediately convert a recession velocity into a distance in megaparsec straight away. So, and, and you can check that this relationship more or less hold. The average mm, density of galaxy, given the, uh, the mass of a typical galaxy and its average distance to, 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 an, uh, to the next galaxy, kind of match H0 square. There is a factor of 10-ish missing, and that might allude to the fact that the mass that we see in galaxy is not all of the mass in the universe, but still is not too far as an order of magnitude. Okay, yeah, sure, I repeat the question for the benefit of Zoom people. So, um, uh, here it was, uh, but, well, but the, the, um, the uh, um, equality between the Hubble scale and the density of galaxies in the local universe should be an accident, uh, said the question, said um, the participant, because uh, the expansion of the universe is not produced by, by the matter, but what is produced by? is produced by matter plus dark matter plus dark energy. But after all, matter plus dark matter, it doesn't make more than, is less than one order of magnitude away from the total energy. So at this level of the accuracy of this computation, within a factor of 10, yes, we are more or less there. So, so as I said, it doesn't quite match, it's within a factor of 10. So, and indeed, the dark matter in the universe, we know, I mean, this mass, in principle, includes also the dark matter halo. And the, the dark matter in the universe makes more than one fifth, almost one fourth of the mass in the universe. But this decomposition should be dominated by dark energy. Absolutely, yes. The, this computation, the um, Hubble rate is, uh, Hubble expansion is dominated by dark energy, but less than a factor of 10. That's why this is not too wrong. I mean, as, as you can see, the level I'm doing the computation this is not a derivation, it's just comparison of order of magnitude. So dark matter is about one third of dark energy. It's not 100 of dark energy, it's just one third. Okay, so we are, we are here. We are eight kiloparsec from the center of the galaxy, uh, which is megaparsec away from neighboring galaxy. And in general, you have to go few megaparsec to see uh, another galaxy. So where we, we would expect to see um, gravitational wave from? So w what is the typical, um, let, let me cancel a little bit this. Let me cancel. You can do this uh, as an exercise. It's, it's a trivial computation, it's just multiplications and fractions. <coughs> Okay, so I, as already anticipated, so we, we have a metric, and 
we, we want to expand around Minkowski metric. So for all what matters, we'll be working in uh, Minkowski plus something, and this something is the gravitational wave. This is not quite correct because we should be using Friedman Robertson Walker plus something. No? We should be using the expanding universe plus something. Correct, but the um, difficulty introduced, I mean, the modification introduced by not considering Minkowski but by considering Friedman Robertson Walker, so an expanding universe, are so mild and so straightforwardly implementable in our results that we don't care about them for the moment. We just implement everything around Minkowski, and then at the end, we just do the little tweaks we need to take into account the expansion of the universe. So what, what is the typical um, signal we can expect to measure? So as I said, the typical, let's say, H00 of the Schwarz, I mean, imagine that we consider the, the Earth uh, the Schwarzschild solution due to the mass of the Earth, we expect the typical perturbation uh, be given by this, okay? So mass of the Earth uh, is 10 to the minus 3. Let's, let's do the sun. The sun and the distance sun-Earth, okay? So for the sun, by definition, this is 1.5 kilometer, because as I told you, G Newton is just a converter from the sun, so it's kilometer. And here we are of the order uh, of 100 million kilometers. So the typical uh, gravitational perturbation caused by the sun here at, uh, at the Earth is of the order of 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9. I mean, I don't want to be too careful about minus 8, minus 9. Okay, do gravitation, are gravitational waves com comparable with that? Actually, gravitational waves are much uh, weaker than that. What we observed, the gravitational wave you observed so far with uh, LIGO and Virgo, they came from uh, 100 megaparsec away up to the gigaparsec. They were very far from us, 100 megaparsec and gigaparsec. So, and they, and, and they came from... Uh, uh, solar, um, from solar mass type of object. So if you, if you plug here G M star divided by 100 megaparsec, what is the typical perturbation that we get? Well, we just, I just erased the computation. One parsec was 10 to the 13 kilometer. One megaparsec is 10 to the 19. 100 megaparsec, I get two, two, two more order of magnitude. So the, this is the typical perturbation of an object that is at 100 megaparsec. And by the way, here I'm assuming that, that is producing a, a, a gravitational um, perturbation, which is of the order of its mass. Actually, this is true for the Newtonian potential. What will be true for the gravitational wave that will respond to some other components of the metric I have a, a V square suppressing factor. So the source of the gravitational wave perturbation is not the mass, but it's the kinetic energy of the system. So let's say, okay, you were worse because V is always smaller than one, okay? But let's forget about this V suppression. So if you forget, even forgetting with this V suppression, even assuming that our sources are very relativistic, then we get, sorry, this, the, uh, we get to this uh, incredibly small number, 10 to the minus 21. And then you might think, well, why on earth we, are, we even think of measuring something so small when um, even the sun gravitational system is 13 order of magnitude larger? Well, the sun gravitational system is pretty static. Mm? We have it with minor, minor modulation, whereas these perturbations are waves. So you must have seen on uh, the profile of the gravitational waves that are here rep reproduced very faithfully, okay? It has a typical behavior, which has uh, an amplitude which is increasing, a frequency which is increasing, and then at some point it stops increasing because it corresponds to the moment where the two components of the binary system merge and form a single object, and so you, you have this envelope. So the idea is that this, uh, will give you a specific pattern. Not only will be uh, changing in time, but, uh, but 
what is more important even is that the frequency will change in time. So it will not only be an oscillating signal, but this, the frequency of the oscillation will change according to a specific pattern. And this specific um, change in the, uh, in the pattern of oscillation is what we can measure and what gives a handle to bridge this 13 order of magnitude gap. I mean, if you want to see a static noise on the top of the gravitational field of the sun, of the earth, forget it. You will never, experimentally, you will never be able to see it, okay? Because we are looking at something well outside our galaxy that is producing a signal whose amplitude is smaller or at most equal to the Newtonian potential of it. So if you, t if you want to detect its static uh, contribution, its contribution to the static uh, perturbation of the metric, forget it. But its contribution to a specific uh, time varying then we can hope to find it. And this is probably in the, in the last lecture, I will show you how the um, uh, observatory are uh, designed to detect this kind of uh, signal, provided it has a specific frequency pattern. We would never ever be able to detect this very small signal if it was in a very um, specific uh, frequency pattern that is the one we can pre predict for gravitational waves. And so, and, and this leads us to the, um, to the point of having an accurate prediction of uh, this uh, frequency pattern, because that's the key handle that allows us to detect a signal. And uh, probably you can start thinking, you can start envisaging now why I took it so large. Now we are getting to the amplitude business. To make an accurate prediction of this frequency pattern, we need a very good understanding of the dynamic of the source. And uh, so we need uh, a very good understanding what is the potential between the two objects that is um, keeping them bound, and what is the emission rate, which is making the orbit shrink and the gravitational wave leak. Once we have a very good understanding of these two things, then we can make a very good prediction of this uh, frequency pattern. Then we can fold in and analyze the data uh, that comes out of LIGO and Virgo and in the near future from CAGRA and in, in, even in, in, in some time from, from, from uh, Indigo, and see basically that you have a noise output which is of the detector, which is like this. And you know the noise output contains all frequencies. You see? The, the noise output of the detector contains noise at all frequencies. And then hidden inside this noise, there will be a tiny little signal that on the other hand is very precise and clean, okay? And what we'll be doing, we'll do the, we'll sketch some of the computation that people do in order to predict this signal pattern that is hidden inside the noise. And then you can already imagine that if you take a correlation, if you take a correlation with, uh, let's, let's cancel a, Milky Way now. If you take a correlation between exactly the same signal that you have pre-computed, and if exactly the same signal is hidden in the data, then you can expect that the correlation will um, pop out. While the noise decorrelate from the signal, the signal will pop out in the correlation. There were questions? No, no questions. Yes, question? Who was? You. Hello? Okay. So uh, two quick questions. Like uh, when you do perturbation, I didn't really get why you, you didn't really need to use the FLRW metric. Like you chose, you chose Minkowski over it, but why so? Okay. Because, uh, I mean, I didn't tell you. I mean, that's part of uh, the course, but to jump ahead, uh, basically we'll, um, we'll, we'll divide our modeling into, into, into phases. So we look at sources from at the, at the size of, their, um, of the size of the binary system. So the source for us is a binary system. A star alone usually doesn't emit unless it, it is very asymmetric. So the prototypical source, the one that source all the LIGO Virgo um, uh, signals is a binary system. And the binary system is emitting gravitational waves that travel the entire uh, universe. And we'll see that the, the system we're interested about have this size. 
kilometer, hundreds of kilometer size. And then we look at them a megaparsec away. The detector, LIGO, is 100 megaparsec away or gigaparsec away. So here, gravity would very much look like electromagnetism. We, we have, you have gravity self-interacting, of course, but at this distance, the perturbation is so small that you can forget any self-interactions. Mm -hmm. But you have to consider uh, cosmological expansion effects. Okay. So we consider here cosmological expansion effects, and we'll show that there is a simple way to fold them in. Here, at the level of the um, uh, source, since we are a kilometer size, we really see the strong effect of gravity. So you already seen some Feynman diagram this morning. So there will be, you see, gravitational mode will be emitted, will be widely interacting with each other, and will be responsive all of the dynamics here. But here, you can completely neglect any expansion of the universe, having curvature of the galaxy or anything like that, because it will be real at a kilometer scale. Okay. Does it answer your question? Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> Thanks. So here, gravity will much like look, will look a little bit like QCD, with the difference that unlike QCD, it's really perturbative because you remember uh, the metric perturbation is GM over R, and uh, when GM over R goes larger than one, only inside the black hole horizon, but we never go inside the black hole horizon. So gravity is kind enough that the, the property of being perturbative is somehow hard coded into it. So outside of the black hole horizon, gravity is by definition a perturbation smaller than one, so it's good to expand in it. And by the way, V square for bound object is GM over R, where R is this kilometer size distance. So V square is always smaller than one, and GM over R is always smaller than one. This is just Kepler's law, eh? This is just Kepler's law, Newtonian Kepler's law standard. And so we know that we can treat perturbatively the self-interaction of gravity, and uh, we can treat at the same time the self-interaction of gravity that will go as power of GM over R, and the non-relativistic effect, sorry, the relativistic non-GR effect, powers of Vs, okay? Of course, here, one has to, to be consistent, we'll have to consider powers of Vs and power of GM over R on equal footing because it's a bound system, so the two are, are of the same order, and we'll be doing that. Here, we consider all the special relativistic non-GR effect and all, all the GR effect that comes in power of GM over R to model the system here and then to get a prediction of the waveform here that here eventually we have to correct with the cosmological effect, but only here. Okay, so, but then you may ask, well, but why do we want to see gravitational wave from 100 megaparsec away? Could we see gravitational wave from sources in South our galaxy? Then they would be louder, of course, because if we see kiloparsec away instead of 100 megaparsec away, then it would be very good. The point is that this is not an entirely to us to, to choose. We could, we have a handle to choose that, but not with LIGO. So what happens? Okay, let me cancel this ugly thing. So, what, what we can see what we can see with LIGO is, ve is very limited by the, by the detector noise. Of course, now we have an observatory. The observatory has to measure something very, very tiny in a specific frequency band. Who tells us what is the frequency band? Well, experimentalists. The experimentalists are very good, but they cannot build a detector that de detects gravitational perturbation at any frequency, okay? So when you look at uh, LIGO noise sensitivity curve, they usually plot the square root of the noise spectral density. With abuse of notation, sometimes I will call it spectral density. Uh, and this is as units of inverse square root of Hertz. This, uh, this is very funny. You may think, why inverse square root of Hertz and not square root of second? Well, for historical reason. Of course, inverse square root of Hertz is the same thing as square root of time, okay? And so in these funny units, the noise sensitivity curves of LIGO is of this kind. Here you have a noise wall of the, at 20 hertz, and here you have loss of sensitivity at the kilohertz. Hmm? This is the frequency, this is the noise level. In, and the, the typical values here are 10 to the minus 23, uh, and here you get 10 to the minus 20. Okay, this is logarithmic scale. So the detector tells you, look, you can only see things in tens of hertz, hundreds of hertz, kilohertz. It's like this. It's the detector. You cannot do better. 
So that means that the frequency of gravitational wave has to be in this order. By the way, why we cannot go? Because uh, the way the detector is made, okay, I will talk about the detector, but I can anticipate it's an interferometer. The idea is that light is going back and forth into perpendicular arms. And when the light arrives, it will shake the two arms in a differential way. If you shake in, in the same way, the recombined light will not see the effect of the gravitational wave. But if you shake the two arms in a differential way, then you will see the effect of the gravitational wave in the recombined light. I will derive this effect. Now I'm just throwing in qualitatively. Um, and uh, the idea is that, mm, uh, sorry, I was dancing and then I forgot what I was going to say. I, uh, that's the fact of dancing. Um, so um, you, you get, ah, yes. Um, if you want to monitor this, you want to monitor this uh, effect of the shaking of the space time in the two arms uh, um, in some regional frequency, you have to be sure that your mirrors, which are at the end of the interferometer, are stable enough. And you cannot go beyond 10 hertz in this uh, stability, just because the mirrors have to be hanged somewhere. Of course, they are hanged in the z direction, but they are free to move in the x, y direction, because they are free to react to the gravitational wave perturbation. But they must be hanging, otherwise you, know, you cannot put them in an Einstein elevator. It wouldn't be feasible to have an experiment that is running for one year in an Einstein elevator. No? They have to be hanging, so they are free only in the x, y direction, not in the z direction. The thread that is hanging hand must be bolted somewhere, and so there might, I mean, whatever vibration in the ground will be transmitted to the mirror. So it's very, very difficult, to, apparently, uh, as you can guess, I'm not an experimentalist, but uh, it's very, very difficult to isolate um, low frequency vibration of the ground. So people are very smart, they make inverting pendulum, they, they attach one pendulum after the other to make a, a very, uh, to, to clean uh, the vibration, but to clean vibration below 10, 20 hertz is very difficult. So basically, all vibration of the soil at 10 hertz, 5 hertz, 1 hertz, they go through. So forget seeing anything at 20 hertz, 1 hertz. So what you say, a problem will not arise in the... Space, space. exactly. So this is a problem for ground-based detector, but then if you go to space-based detector, then you can have a sensitivity curve which is projected from 10 to minus 2, to 10 to the minus 5, so the sensitivity curve is a bit worse, but uh, it's in this low region of frequency. Here, because you don't have to compete with vibration of the soil, but you have to compete with some other vibration. This will be LISA-like detector. Detector that works on the same basic principle, light going to arms of interferometer, but now the mirror are not hanging anywhere, they're just uh, free to float in space. They are freely falling in space, and so you get there. You have other challenges I'm not going to go into. So the overall sensitivity is worse, but here uh, sources are also louder. So you will see a lot of more sources there, and we'll show why sources are louder here. But let's go back here. So the typical frequency we are sensitive to then is 100 hertz. Uh, 150 hertz is the bucket. So if you translate that to a wavelength, uh, 100 second to the minus one, you divide, uh, you multiply, uh, yes, um, sorry. You take the speed of light, which is the same on gravitational way, you divide by 100 hertz. 100 hertz goes here. This is 3, 10 to the 5 kilometer per second, divided by 100 in second. And you see that the typical scale you get of order of hundreds of kilometers. Okay, then there is, this is two, actually, uh, yes, F, yes, th this is the typical wavelength, okay? The typical wavelength of the wave. So the sources that you are monitoring with this kind of experiment, they must have um, a typical wavelength of uh, hundreds of kilometers. And then if you think of a binary, what is the typical wavelength? The typical wavelength is the same as the period of the binary, okay? I mean, that's clear, no? You have an object uh, going around each other, the period is also the wavelength because uh, the speed of light is equal, to, the speed of gravitational wave is equal to one. So if you plug this, mm, uh, the typical, yes, the, frequ the, and the frequency you translate to this 100 kilometers, then you must get objects which are 
uh, at least as compact as, as less than 100 kilometers. So if you want to expect to see few orbits before they merge, each object should be less than 100 kilometers. And 100 kilometers in size, given that the spatial radius of a solar mass object is three kilometers, then you can expect you can get up to 50, okay? With 50 solar masses, you expect that your signal basically merge here. Hmm? You have only a little bit of signal inside your band, no? Because clearly the frequency... 10 to the 5 is, yes, you're right. This is lambda, yes. 10 to the, yeah, we, we are talking about 1,000 kilometer in the wavelength. 1,000 kilometer in the wavelength, if you translate into, um, yes, this is uh, the, uh, this is, the, ah, okay. Yes, well, sorry, this was what I was missing. Okay, Th this is the wavelength that LIGO is sensitive to of the order of 1,000 kilometer. And uh, this is the wavelength of the source is the same time, the same thing as the period of the source, okay? But the period of the source is the typical radius of the source, the distance between the two binaries. For all what concerns our results, we can think of the um, binary constitu constituent as point-like. We'll see that the effect that the binary constituents are not point-like, we introduce milder effect in our modeling. It's only mild effect. For first approximation, we can consider as the object to be point right. So this is the wavelength LIGO is sensitive to, which is equal to the period, which is distance divided by V, okay? And so basically you see that the, the, this typical distance is suppressed with respect to these thousand kilometers by a factor of V. So for objects which are really at relativistic uh, speed, uh, you can see them a uh, um, distance of 1,000 kilometers. But if you see object at, uh, at a relative speed of 10, one tenth of the speed of light, one percent of the speed of light, you really get into the regime of kilometers, okay? So this is really the typical size of the object we are looking at because of the LIGO sensitivity curve. I mean, we have that. Of course, with ELISA, when you move a factor of six in order of magnitude in the frequency, then you can um, see uh, objects which are a factor of six as an order of magnitude, so a million times larger. So instead of seeing solar massive black holes, 10, 20 solar massive black holes, you can expect to see million solar massive black holes, tens of million solar massive black holes. Okay? I mean, it, it's a simple scaling. You get the frequency here, you scale it, the frequency gives you a size, the size the, give you a wave. Be careful, yes, I was forgetting in the first computation. Uh, the wavelength is not actually the size of the system, it's the size of the system divided by V, because the wavelength is the period, and the period is the size divided by V, where V is the typical internal velocity of, of the system. And so this V tells you that the size of the object must be smaller than the wavelength, V times lambda, okay? So you get solar system type object for LIGO, just because of the frequency. The way the, the detector is built obliges you to look at that. For LISA, it goes to space, then you don't have the problem of vibration of the soil, you don't have ha mirror hanging, so you can go to six order of magnitude less in frequency, so you can go to six order of magnitude higher in, um, in masses. But this is not the end of the story. Actually, it came one month ago, the announcement that it was gravitational wave at 10 to the minus eight hertz has been identified just in a narrow frequency band around, uh, uh, around um, 10 to the minus 8 hertz. I mean, even if you work in particle physics, even if you didn't know what the gravitational wave was until one month ago, you should have heard about that, no? It was nanograph. So what did they see? They saw, uh, they were monitoring over, over how much, 15, 20 years. So now I need back my galaxy. So we are here, and we know there are pulsar everywhere around in, in the galaxy. You know what pulsar are? Pulsar are neutral stars, which are objects roughly the, si the mass of our sun, but concentrated in the size of Sao Paulo. The mass of the sun concentrated in, in 10 kilometers. And they are rapidly rotating because they inherited the angular momentum of their progenitor star when they collapse. They're rapidly rotating, and they have this magnetic field over which particles in, uh, in spiraling emit light. And this light is very regular and it's like a lighthouse. So, um, uh, um, 
the magnetic field in general doesn't point to, the axis of the magnetic field doesn't need to point to us, but since they rotate, the rotation of axis is not aligned with the magnetic field, basically like a lighthouse, lighthouse one every time they go around, they, they send to us a, a signal. And they've been monitoring the order of 60 of these pulsars around uh, in our galaxy. And they saw there was, and despite the signal being very, very regular, they saw some correlated uh, irregularities on the time of arrival of the signal. That was compatible with the, with the background of gravitational wave, basically. A stochastic background of gravitational wave coming from all over the directions. At this frequency, what set this frequency? Just the time of observation. Since this uh, system has been monitored for tens of years, one year is pi 10 to the seven second, three years is 10 to the eight second. This gives you the time scale of uh, this frequency, this observation, okay? So monitoring the signal of the pulsar, which is very regular over years, allows you to check if there is any correlation in the irregularity of the time of arrival of the pulsar. Indeed, there was. So they ascribe these irregularities to the effect of a stochastic background on gravitational wave that is all the time there. Uh, what could be the source of this, I mean, um, uh, background? Well, there are many sources. The most conservative uh, explanation would be coalescence of binaries. This time, how big? 10 to the nine solar masses. Do we, do we know, do they exist even, do we even exist, do we even know to exist in the universe black hole of 10 to the nine solar masses? Indeed, yes. At the center of the galaxy, in principle, at the center of every galactic, um, Arctic, Arctic galactic uh, nuclear galaxy, there seem to be a 10 to the 9-ish um, supermassive black holes. So 10 to the 9 supermassive, nine, 10 to the 9 solar massive black holes do exist. When they merge, when the galaxy merge, the center of force, this supermassive black hole, there is one per galaxy, no more. In our galaxy, we have a, a tiny supermassive black hole. Our Supermassive black hole is only 10 to the 6, so it's not, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the low range of the supermass. But these 10 to the 9, there are plenty. Um, each galaxy might have one, or maybe it might host a binary system of supermassive black holes inside the engine of the active galactic nuclear. So this is the most conservative um, explanation for the source of this stochastic background. I mean, these sources are very long. They could last basically for a fraction of the life of the universe, so what you see is just a superposition of many of them, and then you see a, a stochastic effect of this. Maybe with more years of data, nanograph will be open to spot individual sources, but we don't expect that they spot one individual source. There, there should be order of 100 individual sources that a high signal to noise ratio might be distinguishable from a diffuse background. For the moment, they only saw a diffuse background. Okay. Yes, question. I, I will repeat, I will repeat the question, go ahead. So this frequency only comes from the time of observation. So the, the observation is this, we are here on Earth, and we see 60 pulsars from all over our galaxy. Um, and we monitor over one year, and we see regularity over one year. One year is pi to the seven, one year is pi 10 to the seven second. So the inverse of this is 10 to the eight, 10 to the minus eight. That's the scale of, of the, so that, that tells you that this kind of observation cannot change too much the frequency. There's not much you can do to tweak, you just wait. While you wait, you increase uh, the time of observation, but basically the frequency you're monitoring decrease with the, linearly with the time of observation. So they say by the end of your PhD, you pass from one year to three years, you get a factor of three in the frequency you reduce, but there's not much you can do to change the frequency range of this observation. That's all right. But the question is, that frequency could be generated only from the merger of supermassive black holes? No, no, absolutely. No, no, there are many, I mean, if you look at the, if you just Google or go to Inspire and nanograph um, mm -hmm. source gravitational wave, you find hundreds of paper. That's correct. There could yes. be cosmological sources which are diffused. Cosmic uh, strings, phase what, what, whatever, in the right? universe, a lot of things. Since I'm very conservative, I don't like going beyond GR. I don't like invoking anything we don't have seen, yeah. of course. That's my taste. You don't have to, to <laughs> buy it. 
let's say, the, the most conservative, uh, since we know supermassive black holes are there, we even see a few galaxies merger, we know the, this kind of merger or galaxy produce a signal. It's enough to explain all of the nanograph? Nobody knows, we'll see. There could, but otherwise, yes, could be phase transition in the early universe, I mean, there are zillions of exotic effects, but we, with more data, uh, we'll be able to pinpoint the actual source. If you could get to that frequency with an observation window of three years, wh why did they wait for nearly 20 years? <laughs> well, basically, uh, there are two things. When you increase the time of observation, basically you stretch the, the lower edge of your frequency, but then you also uh, you have to do a coherent analysis. So basically, when you do a coherent analysis, you take a correlation between the signal coming from one pulsar and the signal coming from the other pulsar. So there, there will be, at this level, there will be a lot of source of noise with uh, uncorrelated. So if you see the signal from pulsar one and you correlate for the signal with pulsar two, then will be noise one times noise two, and then will be H gravitational wave times A gravitational wave that is the same, okay? So the, this product grows linearly with time. This product, no, it's like a random walk, okay? So the more time you, you take data for, um, basically the, sig the sensitivity of this kind of correlation grows as the square root of time, because the square grows linearly with time, so your sensitivity grows with the square root of time. So basically, you need time to increase the sensitivity. So the frequency is fixed by the time of observation, but also the sensitivity is fixed by modulo and overall factor, of course, which I don't know, right? So you increase your sensitivity by square root of time of observation. So yes, by in three times, you increase uh, the sensitivity by 1.5, but you also include more frequency beam here. Thank you. Okay, so this is nanogram. Of course, I don't work in nanogram, I don't work with pulsar, but you know, since it was one month ago, it was all, all, all over the headlines. I missed the, the conference uh, because I was traveling that day, but of course, I mean, everybody else is, was, was attending it and talking about it, and it was very, very popular and very hot. Okay, so since I have introduced the, uh, how much time, who is the, yeah, how much time do I have? Uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes plus question or 10 minutes with questions? 10 minutes with questions. With questions. So let me give you three minutes since I introduced um, pulsars. So pulsars are ubiquitous in astronomy and in gravitational wave. Uh, let's give them the, the importance they deserve, even if only for five minutes. So uh, as I said, pulsars are very common in our galaxy. We see thousands of pulsars. So pulsar is this isolated neutral star that is ro rotating and just once every time it goes around, the light beam, which is not light through radio, but I mean, it's electromagnetic, hit us, and so we see thousands of them. But they're so common, so we see thousands of them, and then they should be million because their beam is focused. So if we only see the focused one, all of them, they should be 1,000 times uh, more numerous than the ones we see. But then there is something nice. Let's cancel the gravitation. Let's, re is that, let's go back to our model of the Milky Way. So we are eight kiloparsecs away, and then we see pulsars from all over. Then there are a handful, oh, a bit more of a handful, some 20-ish uh, pulsars which are in binary system. And actually 12 of them, for 12 of them, the, um, the, uh, actually no, oh, 100 which are in binary system, but 18 which are in a binary system with another neutral star. So we know this because they are in, sorry, they're in a binary system that we can see so well that we can measure not only the mass of the, the pulsar, but the mass of the companion, okay? If we see a binary system through Kepler's law and through 1PN analysis that we do, you can measure the two masses of the binary system. When you measure the, the two masses of the binary system, you get to know that it was a, a white dwarf or a, a, you know the size of, of, of the binary. I mean, a white dwarf has 1,000 kilometer radius. So if you see the, uh, the binary system tight enough, it cannot be a white dwarf neutral star. So we know that there are roughly uh, a bit less than 20, 18 binary neutron star system in our galaxy. And these only count in the pulsar, those who are injecting their lighthouse to us. So there must be many more. And we see that, that all of them are me, hundreds of millions, billions of years away from merger. How do we know them? Well, we have, we have to compare 
what is uh, the time of variation of their period. We divide by, their, by the period. This is the time, uh, inverse of time, and this, by definition, is the merger time. It's, I mean, this is just a brutal linear approximation. You know that something is decelerating. You divide by the period we test now, and then you have a very, very rough um, estimate of how long it will take. Actually, this is the inverse of time. This will be the inverse of the merger rate. Okay. So, uh, what is uh, uh, the fact that the period is changing due to? These objects are very compact. There's no gas. There's nothing around them. It can only be gravitation. So we say that I'm, now I'm saying that this is basically e dot over e modulo a prefactor. As you can guess, today I wasn't very worried about factors, no? Why? Uh, the energy of a circular, these objects are roughly, in, they're not in circular orbit, they're elliptic, but let's approximate the orbit as circular. When the orbit is circular, radius and time of, of period of the orbit, they are equivalent one to the other, no? You have Kepler's law. You have V squared is equal to GM over R. And so you can use this and, and you can say that um, um, 2 pi r over t equal, equal to gm 2 pi over t. You see, I multiply by 2 uh, pi over t and I put r on the other side. So this, this now becomes v cube and this is becomes gm omega. Okay? This is to say frequency or period, velocity or radius, they're all the same thing. I mean, they're not the same thing, they're all related. You fix one, you fix the other two. Okay? So this is tells you that if I get p dot over p and e as a monomial relationship to p, well, p dot over p must be the same of e dot over e, okay? Modulo prefactor. So the energy of the circular orbit, I write the reduced mass v square. Am I forgetting anything? So this is a kinetic energy plus potential energy. The potential energy is minus twice the kinetic energy, so I'm just forgetting a minus. This is the total energy, kinetic plus potential, of a bound system. And then I need to know E dot. E dot, of course, I need general relativity, but we can already guess something. So E dot is energy divided by time. We know that energy modulo G is the same as time, is the same as length. So I say that this object must be equal to a dimensionless number uh, divided by G. GE divided by time is dimensionless. So E dot must be a dimensional number divided by G. Okay? So what happens here is that this dimensionless number is actually V to the 10. This is highly non-trivial. That we'll derive it tomorrow or Wednesday. But um, uh, this is basically at the heart of the quadrupole formula. The uh, time derivative of the energy due to the gravitational leak, the fact that gra gravitation is radiating, must give you an E dot, which is a pure number, modulo a power of G. And this pure number is V to the 10. I will demonstrate. This is highly non-trivial. That it has to be a, a, a function of V, well, it's clear, no? because here you have all these uh, different um, uh, variables. You can depend on velocity, frequency, radius, but they're all related. So I pick V, which is already dimensionless, and it has to be V. So that it has to be a, a positive power of V, it's also kind of intuitive, no? because you expect that if the guy is rotating faster, he's emitting more. Okay? So, but the fact that the exponent is actually 10, well, you cannot get heuristically. You have to do the computation we'll do tomorrow, okay? And that's it. If, if you really want to be picky about the scaling of the object, here I write as symmetric mass ratio by the total mass, where symmetric mass ratio is m1, m2, divided by m square. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's clear that the reduced mass is symmetric mass ratio by the total mass, just a way of rewriting. This is a nice way because when, whenever you have a binary system, you say, oh, but then I have two mass scale. Well, no, I have one mass scale, the total mass, and I have the symmetric mass ratio. It's easy, no? So you only have a dimensionless number and a, a dimension full mass scale. So here, whatever is, it's a bit, it's also non-trivial, you, you get a dependence of the symmetric mass ratio as eta square. But anyway, this eta goes from zero to one fourth, and for this binary system of neutral star, it's close to one fourth, so it's not a big factor. So we get that, let's cancel here the spectral noise sensitivity. 
and we get that you see this the time of the merger goes as mass divided by v to the 8 okay or if you like gm divided by 2 to the 8 okay this is a funny thing at least i find it funny you know i, I find funny a lot of things in physics maybe i'm weird so look at this E dot doesn't have any, any mass scale, any length scale. It's a dimensionless number. So it only appears V. OK, eta, but for, let's forget eta. V that appears to this high power, which is crucial for the phenomenology. But again, this high power, we cannot guess. And um, here I have mass. After all, this is the time that is left to merger. And in my binary system, I have only one dimension of full scale. It can only depend on the mass. But look how strange. This is 1.5 kilometers. If I turn it into a time, this is ten, my, this order of microseconds. No? The, the, um, the time it takes light to cross one, one kilometer is microseconds, or 10 to the minus 5. I mean, it doesn't change much, OK? Look at this. This time of a merger, despite being made of a microscopic scale, 10 to the minus 5 seconds, is divided by v to the 8 for this typical system, for this system the typical velocity 10 to the minus 3. After all, 10 to the minus 3 is not so small. Eh? 10 to the minus 3 is 1,000 of the speed of light for an astrophysical object. So, but here you can easily get a huge, I mean, a huge number. 10 to the minus 3 to the minus 8 gives you 10 to the 24. So this easily gives 10 to the 19 seconds. And 10 to the seconds in less than, is larger than Hubble scale. Hubble scale was 70 kilometers per second. Do as an exercise, if you convert it to a time, it gives you 10 to the 10 year, which is pi 10 to the 17 seconds. So look, all the binary system of pulsar we've seen, just by doing some dimensional analysis plus one highly, highly non-trivial piece of information that I put by hand will derive, it go to this huge ultra cosmological scale for the time of merger. So it means that despite you have to only one dimension full parameter, which is microscopic, you get this ultra cosmological scale for the time of merger. And so we learn, uh, for the phenomenology, we learn a very important thing. That these systems are very common, because only the pulsar pointed to us, we see 20 of them in, in binary, a bit less of 20, but order of 20, uh, in binary system with another neutral star. But they're all of them, basically, order of the age of the universe or more from coalescence. So if you want to see the merger of this object at kilometer scale, we need to go beyond our galaxy. So the rate of this object per galaxy, per year, is basically zero. Basically, people have computed much more accurately than what I did here, but this is just a sketch. Basically, the rate of this object per our Milky Way galaxy is one every 100,000 years. Okay? So this is the typical rate. Again, there are order of magnitude, there are caveats, but that depends on the mass. But just to give you the ballpark, one in 10 to the five year. This is the rate of this merger of these objects. So it's how many of them we can expect to see at kilometer distance so that we can see at LIGO. Because all these binaries have velocity 10 to the minus 3. If you plug here 10 to the minus 3, here you get 10 to the minus 6. It means that they are million kilometers away, one from each other. So they are not in the band of LIGO. OK? So this is really a back of the envelope computation of their um, rate. So you see, oh, wait, but then these objects, we see them, we know they emit gravitational waves, but they are not in the LIGO band. If you want to, SP, if you want to hope to see at least one of them um, in the LIGO band, we should look at a number of galaxies to have at least one per year. So if this is the rate for one galaxy, we should expect to see at least 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 galaxies to see one per year. And what does, which distance correspond to 10 to the 6 galaxies? Exactly 100 megaparsec, 100, 150 megaparsec. No, the, clearly, the volume goes with the cube of the distance. So if instead of looking at your galaxy, which is, occupies a 1 megaparsec size of the universe, you look to 100 megaparsec, you increase the rate by 10 to the 6, and so you can expect to see few per year. Then actually, we can see much farther than that for massive black hole. This is for binary neutral star. For massive black hole, we can see two gigaparsecs, and so we got to the number, which is 100 per year of the uh, events that LIGO saw. OK, sorry, to be over time. I w and uh, this concludes the trailer part of uh, the course. I just give you a broad overview, just give you hints here and there of what is the phenomenology, what I will do. And so tomorrow, we start really to do 
boring slash funny quantitative binary dynamics. Stop here. Thanks. So we have time for quick questions, real quick questions. So. Hello, thank you for the lecture. I have a question. Would we do we expect to see something on the high frequency end of sensitivity? Okay. Yes. Okay. If you want, if you want to see something at high frequency, let's say kilohertz, we, we are uh, we are um, blind just because of uh, LIGO. LIGO has a lot of noise here. Basically, what happens if you want to count the photons on a very short time scale? then you don't have enough photons. You have a huge error counting. But then you think, forget LIGO. We might have an, an experiment with measure gravitational wave at the megahertz. Who cares? Some fancy new technology that measure things at the megahertz. But then we have to reduce by factor of 1,000 the wavelength. If you reduce by factor of 1,000 the wavelength, then we, we go from kilometer to meter. So we don't see object, compact object at the meter size. I mean, yes. There, there are, me, I have a compact of <laughs> meter size, <laughs> but you know, I'm very little mass. If you put me, me in, I mean, if I dance with my partner anywhere outside the earth, you will never see the gravitational wave, okay? So the problem is to have compact object um, uh, that give a loud, loud enough signal. A compact object with solar mass or more. It just happened that astrophysically, we do not, we know of objects of any size. Asteroids can have any mass, basically. The Earth is 10 to the minus 3, the solar mass. But if you have an object of kilometer size, it must be solar mass or more, okay? Just because you need to have enough mass to have collapsed. If you have lighter object than the sun, then it's not compact. Hmm? Asteroid, planet are not compact. And so uh, you reduce the mass, but you don't reduce the size. So it goes <laughs> doubly wrong. No? Because you reduce the mass, like going from, sun, from a black hole to the Earth. You reduce the mass, so you lose um, signal, of course, because the mass is the gravitational charge. But you also increase the size. So you move a lighter object to lower frequency. So the, the way out would be, oh, but who mandate that black holes can only uh, be from the solar mass on? Why black hole of 0.1 solar masses cannot exist? So the fact that black hole of 0.1 solar mass cannot exist is based on our prejudice that we expect the black holes to come from the collapse of stars. And the stars, to have in, first they have to ignite the nuclear reaction to give a star, then they mm, attract more mass, and then the, the nuclear fuel goes off, and then it implodes. If the star is, is less than um, one solar mass, it's not even a star to begin with, so it, all this process doesn't start. But it could be a primordial black hole. If some primordial fluctuation was strong enough on a very short, on a very little scale, sub-kilometer scale, and you, you get a primordial fluctuation of the inflaton or whatever was there on a very short length scale, then you could create a black hole without, without going through the star process. And then you, you avoid the bound. So yes, if we see sources here, then it could be a fingerprint of primordial black holes because that's the only compact object we can have with the subsolar mass. But needless to say, we haven't seen them, otherwise you would know. <laughs> I think we can ask questions to Ricardo later, so let's thank him for the, his first lecture. Thank you, Ricardo. And now we'll stop for the lunch break, and then we we'll resume activities